All right, let's, let's pray before we get started. Father, uh, thank you uh, for the Holy Spirit that you have given to us so that we might know you, so that we might know your word, and so uh, help us to realize he's, he's our teacher, and uh, help us to listen and to follow him in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Holy Spirit, pneumatology. You should uh, be able to figure out that word. Again, a word that, that comes from Latin background, but uh, the first part, pneumonia, pneumatic drill, that simply is, is the Greek word for, that can be translated spirit, wind, air, any of those things. And the Hebrew word is ruach, which same thing, could be translated spirit, air, or wind. And that's why many people, when they think of the Holy Spirit, they do not think of a person. They think of a spirit. <laughs> and to, them, to, to a lot of people, a spirit is not a person. Now, of course, person here does not mean human or that has a body, but has the qualities of a person. We'll be looking at that in a moment. But before we really get to the notes, uh, let's, let's look at John chapter 16. This is, um, this is where Jesus is teaching the disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the importance that he will have in their lives. So it's probably one of the most extensive teachings, uh, direct teachings about the Holy Spirit in scriptures. And so it's a very valuable passage. So that's John chapter 16 starting with verse 5. And this is in the context of Jesus in the, um, basically the upper room um, with his disciples, teaching them uh, just prior to his arrest and crucifixion. So you would like to think the last words he's going to say to his disciples, like any last words, are important words. And uh, we do have that here. So. Verse uh, 5, now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor or the comforter, or the, or the Greek word is paraclete, which means to draw alongside of, to come alongside of. And, and that's a very good image for the, what, the, what the role of the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. Um, and he, he delivers to us what God the Father, God the Son, wants him to deliver. So it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So we've already talked about how... Um, the East and West Church split over one sentence about who sends the Holy Spirit. But this, this passage uh, seems to imply that Jesus, as well as the Father, sends the Holy Spirit. And notice, he says, it is better for you that I go away. Now, how many of you have ever thought, man, it would have been great to live during Jesus' time. I would have loved to have been one of his disciples. Have you ever thought that? Or it would have been great to live in the Bible times and to hear the voice of God every day, <laughs> you know, which really isn't true. You know, we, we read a lot of passages where it talks about how people heard from God and had visions from God, but you also have long periods where God seems to never speak to the, his people. And guess what? We have the word of God. We could hear God speak to us every day. See, we forget that. Or we don't equate that the same. We think it was really special in the Bible. Um, and so a lot of people think, well, it would have been great. But even here, Jesus says, it's better that I go away. Now, why in the world would he say that? Well, because the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit, as he says, will be in you and will dwell with you. In other words, the presence of God will be with you constantly. Even when Jesus was here upon the earth, if you know, Peter had to go visit his mother-in-law while Jesus was down in Jerusalem, Jesus did not go with him. The human Jesus, of course, see? 
So that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm limited as long as I'm in a human body, as long as I'm on this earth. But once I'm gone and the Holy Spirit comes, uh, it'll be a lot better for you. So, um, verse 8, when he comes, now, we're going to see that the Holy Spirit does a lot of things, but this is what Jesus pulls out of all the things that the Holy Spirit does, these are the things he draws attention to, Jesus. And so I would think that these might be a little more important than some of the other things that the Holy Spirit does. Obviously, obviously everything the Holy Spirit does is important, but this might be considered his primary role here upon this earth. So when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So what he says is the whole, the main job of this comforter, this counselor, the Holy Spirit that's going to come, is to convict the world of their sin, of their guilt, their sin, and in convicting them, they will be understanding that they are sinners, that they are far from the righteousness of God, and because they're sinners, they will come under the judgment of God. Now, when you, when you look at that, and you, if you were to say, as I said, that this may be the primary role of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> I believe this gives, gives us a good hint as to what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. If the Holy Spirit's job is to convict, and notice it says the world, so not just believers, because we, we tend to think of conviction as, well, that's what the Holy Spirit brings upon the believer, that's what leads the believer into salvation. Well, yeah, but before you were a believer, you were not a believer. So he brought conviction into you when you were an unbeliever. So he brings conviction to the world. So that tells me the Holy Spirit, if he's doing his job, which I believe he is, he's bringing conviction to this world. Even though you could look at and talk to a lot of people and they act like, Holy Spirit, I don't even know who he is. I don't even think about God. But the reality is the Holy Spirit has been doing some kind of work, I believe, in every single person. And, and how that person responds to that work will also be where that person ends up, in a sense, in his relationship to Jesus Christ and God the Father. So that, I believe, is his primary job, to bring conviction to the world, conviction about their sinfulness, their need for righteousness. And if they don't get that, they will be condemned. And notice verse 12, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. So here's Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. He's telling his disciples this in order to bring them comfort because they were in grief because they had they realized Jesus was leaving and if they did not uh, realize that when he meant he's leaving he was gonna die they would soon realize that but I believe they kinda understood that because he had been telling them that uh, all during his ministry and why else would you be in grief unless you knew that Jesus was gonna die it's not like he's just going away you know on vacation somewhere or on a trip so um, Jesus is saying all these things to comfort his disciples. So these words should bring us comfort also. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, but also the reality that the Spirit is the one who brings us the truth. But it's not the truth that the Holy Spirit himself creates and comes up with, but rather it's the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is the one who, in a sense, reveals Jesus, 
declares Jesus, uh, points to Jesus, glorifies Jesus. So in that sense, you could say the Holy Spirit has a subservient role to God the Father and God the Son. That's his role, not his essence. <laughs> so he, he's not less of God than God the Father and God the Son, but the role that he plays is like a subservient role uh, to the Father and to the Son. But the reality is, when you receive the Holy Spirit, which we're going to find out if you're a believer, you receive the Holy Spirit, uh, it's the Holy Spirit who teaches you, who guides you, who sanctifies you, who does all the things that the Bible says should be happening in your life as a Christian. And so the Holy Spirit is obviously a very important person. And yet, um, um, for many people, the Holy Spirit, many Christians even, the Holy Spirit is kind of a, a secondary thought. Oh yeah, God the Father, I worship Him, I pray to Him, Jesus Christ, He died for me, the Holy Spirit, well, that's kind of mysterious. See, that's, that's how it is. Um, I believe one, what I believe is one good thing from the charismatic Pentecostal movement is, is kind of a reminder, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity and therefore is just as important as God the Father, God the Son. And so we need, to, we need to know the Holy Spirit. We need to understand how he operates in our lives. So obviously what Jesus is saying is the role of the Holy Spirit is going to be different when he leaves. So that begs the question, well, what was the role of the Holy Spirit before Jesus left? Did he have a role? What kind of role did he have in the, in the Old Testament? Anybody want to? Well, do we know it changed? Where does it say that? Right here. <laughs> he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. If I don't go away, he cannot come. So that implies he wasn't here in the same way he's here now. I'm not saying he wasn't present during the Old Testament, but he was present in a different way. He's evolved. <laughs> <laughs> well, his role has evolved, okay? So be careful when you say that. <laughs> but good. Yeah, it, it has changed. So what do you think some of the changes are? Anybody? Want to take a guess? I mean... He was temporarily came upon people in the Bible, but he's... Okay, that, that's one that I think is pretty prominent. There's a verse where uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is with you, but now he will be in you, or he will be in you. So the idea is that the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the believers, whereas in the Old Testament times, he did not indwell them. That's why you hear, read verses, for instance, like um, with King Saul, where it says that the Spirit of God left King Saul. And when you come to the New Testament, you don't, you don't read words like that. Now, we, we can get into a big discussion about can, can a person, quote, lose their salvation, give up their salvation? Can the Holy Spirit leave a person if he's already been there? My belief is that in the New Testament, you, that, that just isn't there. You don't see that in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you, you, you see that. You see that with Saul. Now you could say, well, we're not even sure Saul was a believer. What did David pray when he was convicted of the sin against Bathsheba? Psalm 51. He said, take, well, he, yeah, he says, have mercy on me, but he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, it could be many different things, but I think, I believe the main thing he was talking about the, the Holy Spirit had anointed him specifically to be the king of Israel. And I think what he was saying is, don't remove me from the king, kingship. But it's the idea that, God, I've sinned against you so terribly, you have every right to just let me go and leave me. But please don't do that. We don't, we don't need to pray, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, we could pray, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit to be more active in my life. We could pray things like that. But the reality is that the, the presence of the Holy Spirit is in our life 
And I believe the New Testament teaches us that it's there permanently. So that's, that's probably one of the things. And the main thing is that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came over people, anointed them for specific tasks and things, um, sometimes would come within them, but it wasn't a permanent indwelling. Okay? His role of conviction would have been the same, though, right? Well, w when we talk about uh, salvation, soteriology, we're going to talk about that. Were the, were the people in the Old Testament saved the same way people in the New Testament? You ever think about that no, question? I don't mean that. Well, n no. See, you see, if you if you if you ask the original question, were the people in the Old Testament saved the same way? Then you could say that the role of the Holy Spirit was different. But I, but actually, I'm 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 kind of pulling your leg there, because I I do believe he did bring conviction, but but I think the conviction was more the conviction of breaking the Mosaic law. Not so much as, as, he, as Jesus says here about people rejecting him, denying him, and things like that. Because obviously the Messiah hadn't come yet. But we'll talk about that with salvation. So, so in that sense, the, the Spirit has a different role. Even within the New Testament, we see the, the role of the Holy Spirit evolving. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost is very crucial. We'll look at that today. When, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, in fact, Jesus said, notice he says here, he will come. He'll come when I leave. It's not like he's saying, okay, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit now. And that's why they waited in the upper room. That's why they were there praying, because Jesus had said to them, stay there until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It wasn't like they were just saying, oh, what do we do? I guess we'll just stay here, see what happens. No, they, they knew that Jesus had said, look, the Holy Spirit's coming upon you. Now, now they may not have understood that totally, but they realized something important was going to happen, and they realized Jesus was saying, you need to stay here until that happens. And that's exactly what they did. So we know at the, at the day of Pentecost, something very definite and different happened that didn't happen to these disciples before. And, of course, we usually talk about that as the baptism of the Holy Spirit which we'll talk about in a moment. So, so, okay, so that simply is talking about how the role of the Holy Spirit has changed. And uh, we're mainly, of course, looking at what the New Testament says. As I mentioned before, the Holy Spirit is a person. What makes somebody a person? Well, you see it on your notes. Intellect, emotion, and will. And it's not the amount of intellect you have. <laughs> You just that you have intellect and you have feelings and you have uh, the power to decide. Go ahead. If um, I actually looked into this a lot, mm -hmm. uh, if a person, if all it needs to be a person is to have emotion, feelings, and will, mm -hmm. does that make the serpent in the garden who was uh, describing the beast a person? Because he had clearly had emotion, intellect, and will. Yes, and if you believe that he was a representation of Satan, um, well, we haven't done angelology yet, angelology, so the question is, is Satan a person? Does he have personality? Yeah. Okay, so, yes, the serpent in the, in the Garden of Eden had <laughs> intellect, emotion, and will. Well, that, that's the serpent, but... But see, this is the, the, the other question is, what, the, does the serpent represent something? Did the serpent, was the serpent a body for something else? And, and Orthodox Christianity believes that the serpent at least represented Satan and actually may have been Satan, that Satan used that, that animal in order to speak to Adam and Eve. See, so, so even though it calls him a beast, what they're saying is this, this beast, and, and you know, you, you get, you, you have, to me, you have to ask the question, because one of the judgments on, on that beast was he would crawl on his belly. So does that mean he wasn't crawling on his belly before? I mean, we I don't know that. I think there's a strong possibility he was a dragon. 
Yeah, it could, it could have been some kind of beast that we, that we don't have now. I mean, I, I, I have no problems with you saying that, okay? Yeah. That it was some kind of beast, and when we think of beast, animal beast, dragons are one of those. Uh, you look in Job, Job talks about a number of different beasts that we have no real connection with now. What, what is he referring to? See, Yeah, Leviathan, things like that, so... Yeah, but, but Satan, who the beast represented, certainly has personality. He is a person. So this raises a different question of, like, before the earth was created, didn't angels fall? Like, yeah, angels we'll, we'll cover that in angelology. But angelology. Like, you're now <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of getting ahead of us. But, yeah, that's the, 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 the whole... So serp- wait, serp- serp- wait, serp- angel? Angel? It talks about the battle between Satan and Michael. It says the dragon and his angels. And yeah. It says the serpent of old, the dragon and his angels, probably was Michael and his angels. And Michael and his angels kicked out the dragon out of heaven. So he was a serpent in heaven before he was even in the garden. Well, he was a beast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a beast. He was a beast. Okay. Anyway, so Holy Spirit has intellect, he has emotion, he has will. You have some scriptures there that show that. Um, B, personal activities uh, from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches, he testifies, he guides, he convinces, he restrains, he commands, he intercedes, he loves, he prays. These are not actions which would be performed by an impersonal something, but only by a personal being. I, I particularly like Romans chapter 8. It talks about how the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf and sometimes prays, you know, it says when, when we don't even have words, but the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever, you know, thought, well, I'm going to spend some time in prayer or maybe you were feeling really bad or terrible or something was going on in your life and you're crying out to God, but all of a sudden you, you just can't find words to say or you're so distraught or something. Um, those are the times when you realize, okay, I may not be able to say what I really mean or what I'm feeling, but the Holy Spirit is praying for me, and he's saying exactly what needs to be said. I find that pretty amazing. And then, of course, he guides, he teaches, uh, he convinces or convicts, he restrains us, so on and so forth. And then... Uh, different activities that we give to the Holy Spirit, he can be obeyed. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 10 is when, when uh, um, I, th- I think it talks about uh, Cornelius obeying the Holy Spirit, convicting him in his life. He can be lied to, Acts chapter 5, that's Ananias and Sapphira. It first says, you have lied to God, but then he says, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. See, so... Um, he can be resisted, Acts chapter 7. That's pretty interesting because how can you resist God? There's verses that talk about no one can resist God. Well, I think that's referring to the fact that we can not do the will of God. We can sin against God. And that's what it's talking about. Resisting God is sinning against God. Uh, obviously, we cannot ultimately resist the will of God, but God allows us to rebel against him. He allows us to sin. He can be grieved. That's talking about Ephesians 4.30. That's when we sin against him. He can be reverenced. He can be blasphemed. Uh, that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12, it talks about where Jesus says, even blasphemy against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. A lot of different interpretations as to what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. When you look at the context there, the context is all about the leaders of Israel rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And as we see, saw in John chapter 16, uh, the primary job or one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict people of sin and their guilt. And so to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is basically when the Holy Spirit comes and brings conviction, we basically said, no, I'm not going to listen to you. Why should I listen to you? And so it's a resistance of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, I believe. And, and to me, the religious leaders, that, that's what happened to them. And, and from that point on in Jesus' ministry, his ministry somewhat changed. 
Uh, that, it, that's also the time where it says he began to speak in parables so that uh, the average Israelite person could not understand him, but he would explain the parables to the disciples. So he, Jesus was now showing his resistance to them because they had rejected him. And John, you know, had said that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. So the, the, the religious leaders are the example to me of people who had committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So I tend to believe the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is saying no to the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he's trying to bring salvation to you. Now, the implication is that you cannot be forgiven of it. So it seems to imply that if the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you and you say no, you're not going to get a second chance. Now, I'm not sure I totally believe that. Because you hear testimonies of people, they'll say things like, yeah, at this time in my life, uh, I think the Holy Spirit was convicting me, but I, I kind of resisted him. But then, you know, they go through life and all these things happen, and then something happens and they realize it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. So um, I, I, I think it's a language that kind of says this is, a, this is a very important, crucial, and terrible thing. So don't, don't do it. Okay. So Comment? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, he can be outraged. He can be vexed. He can be quenched. First Thessalonians 5.19. That, that's, that's one uh, that I, I, I'm not totally sure what, what that refers to. It's, it's different than being grieved. He's grieved because of our sin, but he's often quenched. I think in the context there is because we, we refuse to see the work that he's doing. And we, we kind of proceed on our own abilities rather than the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, only two of them are positive um, in our responses. Yeah, okay. You mean obeyed and reverenced. Well, he can also be worshipped. I mean, this isn't a complete list. So you could probably think of other things. Uh, second page, C. Another way you can see the personality, uh, that he is a person, is the personal pronouns that are used. Uh, in fact, the passage we just looked at, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he. He uses the male pronoun, even though the Greek word for spirit is a neuter uh, noun. Now, a lot of languages have male, female, and neuter for their, their nouns. So it, it's not so much, it's not only that Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as he. He did that contrary to normal Greek um, grammar. You would normally use a neuter pronoun to refer to Numa, which is neuter, but Jesus used the male pronoun he, and I I believe that's significant. So what's neuter? Okay, uh, not male or female. <laughs> so so you, you these are are references to nouns. So have you ever taken a foreign language? Okay, because some. Spanish. Okay, uh, does Spanish have male? Yes. And female? Okay. Yeah. What's that? But no, but no neuter. Not, all, not every language has a neuter. So, but, but neuter can refer to like, a, uh, you know, obviously for men and women, you, have, you can see male and female. But if every noun is either male and female, I'm sure in the original Greek, for instance, they had a reason for making it male or female. But certain nouns were probably neuter because it was like, you know, it's like, well, well why is this male? Why is this female? So that's all that means. Okay, so that's the personality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now we come to the deity of the Holy Spirit, explicit claim, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It talks about the Spirit is the Spirit of God. Um, names and titles. Isaiah 6, 1 through 13 is repeated in Acts chapter 28, verse 25, in reference to the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19 is to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's called the Spirit of God. 
Again, we have the incommunicable attributes. He's self-existent, Romans 8, 2. He's infinite, Psalm 139, verse 7. And following, it talks about his omnipresence. Where can I go to get away from the Spirit of God? And I can't, is what David says. Or 1 Corinthians 2.11, it says that he is omniscient. Luke 1.35, it says he's omnipotent, all-powerful. And then Ephesians 4.4 4 talks about the Spirit is one Spirit. So he's involved in the works of deity. He's involved in creation. It says the, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. So the Holy Spirit was there at the time of creation. He gives spiritual life, John chapter 3. Remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus? He said, you must be born again. He goes, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he gives us spiritual life, and 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us he's the author of the Bible. The Holy Spirit receives divine honor. We've already talked about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Lying to him is lying against God. And in relation to the other persons of the Trinity, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Okay, anything about the, the person of the Holy Spirit? His personality and his deity? Any issues with that? <coughs> Just one? <laughs> um, how does Ephesians 4.4 4 talk about the uh, unity of, is that talking about the unity of the Trinity or the unity uh, No, about the, the, the fact that the Spirit is one. He's, he's a unit, you know, he's, okay, let, let's look up the passage. Okay, um, okay Ephesians 4.4. 4. I think that's a passage where he talks about Jesus giving gifts. There's only one, there's one body, one spirit. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the reference that it's talking about. Not, and it, it doesn't necessarily talk about his, uh, the same way as we think of the unity of, of the Father, but it does, does kind of imply that. So 4.4 4 says, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So it's, it's kind of repeating the, what, what's called the, the Shema, Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. So that, that's what it's saying. Where there's one Holy Spirit. There's only one God, though. So if, you, if you, you can't have God as the Holy Spirit as one God, and then God the Father as another God. That's what it's kind of saying. So this, this verse is both, both a, a kind of showing the Trinity as well as showing the unity of, of the Spirit himself. Okay, so works of the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, we read in John chapter 16 that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit uh, is come to glorify him. So in many ways, everything the Holy Spirit does is to point to Jesus Christ, bring attention to him, not to the Holy Spirit himself. Um, and, and, and that's why I say he has like a, a subservient role to, to Jesus Christ. So uh, the work of the Spirit in the world and creation and preservation, just like God the Father, God the Son, are involved in creation and preservation, so is the Holy Spirit. He's involved in the affairs of non-believers. Uh, we see that in, when Jesus was describing that he would bring conviction to the world. But we also see how the Holy Spirit... Um, has affected even people who are not believers. Um, the work of the Spirit in salvation, the Holy Spirit convicts, He regenerates, He indwells, He baptizes, He seals. So we saw, we've already talked about convicting. Conviction is the recognition that you're a sinner in need of salvation. That's, that's a work that the Holy Spirit does in your life. And, and you know, it, 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 even Jesus said that, that only the sick need somebody to heal them, need a physician. If you think you're well, you don't need a physician. You don't need a doctor. If you think you, you're, you're a good person, you're not going to feel like you need salvation. 
In other words, in order to receive salvation, the good news, you, you have to understand there's bad news. The bad news is I'm a sinner and I cannot, I cannot attain my own salvation. So that's, that's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That hopefully that conviction leads to belief. And from Titus 3.5, we see that the Holy Spirit regenerates. He is the one who regenerates. Um, let's, let's go ahead and look at that verse, because it's a, it's a really good verse. Titus 3.5. Um, okay, verse 4, it says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So it's the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. He um, causes us to be born again. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about how the Holy Spirit indwells us. We talked briefly about that, that that's one of the big differences between the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old, Twest, Old Testament. He indwells us. He baptizes us. Now, baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's, that's an issue that there's differing views and opinions on. Uh, if you, if you want to do study on this, obviously Acts, the book of Acts, is where you read of incidences where the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs. The first one, of course, is on the day of Pentecost when all the disciples were baptized with the Holy Spirit. It said that they could see flames of fire above their heads. Um, they spoke in, at least the context there, they seem to have spoken in earthly languages that they did not know so that other Jewish people who were there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, they were able to say, wow, they're praising God in my language. Now, this is really important to understand because when a Jew who lived in France <laughs> made the trek and came to Jerusalem for a feast day like the Feast of Pentecost, when he would go to the temple, all the worship was in Hebrew, or in Jesus' time, Aramaic, but more likely in Hebrew. And so even though you were a Jew living in France and could speak French probably, you also could speak um, Hebrew. Uh, I had to go to town um, after second class this morning, and I was uh, listening to NPR, and they were interviewing a guy who is doing a Broadway show uh, on, um, oh, what's, what's the one about the, the Jewish guy? Um, Fiddler on the Roof. But it's a production that's, that's being done in Yiddish. Anybody know Yiddish? Anybody here have a Jewish background? Yiddish is a kind of a, um, a European version of, of Hebrew. But it's a foreign language, basically, to most of us and to a lot of Jewish people who no longer speak Yiddish. But, you know, they even had some excerpts, and, and it's really interesting, you know. Uh, if you know anything about the Fiddler on the Roof, one of the famous songs is, If I Were a Rich Man. Well, in Yiddish is, If I Were a Rothschild. Anybody know who the Rothschilds are? They were a wealthy family in France in the 1800s, 1900s. And, and so the idea that it, here's a, a, a Jew in Eastern Europe um, realizing there were rich Jewish people in France, the Rothschilds. And, and so, um, but that was some of the thing. And so the idea that when you worshiped God, you worshiped in Hebrew, even if you were French or German or English or whatever. It would be like when we went to church, uh, every time we went to church, even if, you were all English speakers. We, the church service was in Latin, which is what the Catholic Church did for a long time. It was only in the 20th century that they finally said, oh, we don't have to have the Latin or the mass in Latin. We could have it in whatever the language of the country is. So the reality is when these people from all these different places around 
the world around the Mediterranean Sea came to Jerusalem, they heard the words of worship, which they would normally hear in Hebrew, they heard it in their own language. So that, that had to be, in a sense, one, startling to them, but very satisfying. It's like, wow, it's so great to hear the praises of God in my own language, especially if Hebrew was their second language. Hebrew was the language they learned because they were Jewish. So that, that's, in a sense, the miracle that happened is that these disciples who did not know these languages broke out in these languages and it says specifically that what they said was they were praising God. That's what the, the kind of tongues at that time was. Now, the rest of Acts talks about other occasions where there was what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some were accompanied with tongues, speaking in tongues. Others were not. And then um, 1 Corinthians 13, or 12, um, and then chapters 14, um, talk about spiritual gifts. Uh, in 13, it talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There it talks about if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, then you're not a child of God. So from that passage, it implies that every single believer has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the difference is in some groups, some believe that there's the, they call a second um, act of grace, a second incident of the coming of the Holy Spirit into a person's life, they label it as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some groups say that the only evidence of that is speaking in tongues, others do not say that. So that's the range of, of belief about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Um, and, and some believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what initiates you into the body of Christ. Others believe it's a secondary activity that comes upon you that shows the Holy Spirit coming upon you in a special way. And I think you can find scripture for both perspectives on that. Do you have any questions on baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is that something that doesn't occupy your minds or you've already settled it or whatever? Talk a lot about it a lot. Okay, go ahead. Uh, do you believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit only manifests itself in the form of tongues or is there other ways of presenting the sacrament? Well, I think there was, there's one occasion in Acts where, the, where it says that the people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's no mention of tongues. Now, it doesn't mean that tongues didn't occur. But, so you have one incident where there, there's no tongues that are accompanied by it. But then if you go to Corinthians, and when Paul extensively talks about the gift of tongues, you either have to say that gift of tongues he's talking about is different than the gift of tongues that comes with the baptism of the Spirit in Acts, or if you say it's the same thing, then Paul himself says not everyone speaks in tongues. See, so um, I, I believe that, that the Bible does not um, specifically say that uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is evidenced by speaking in tongues. <coughs> baptism, uh, the best way to, to me to understand baptism is uh, association. When you're baptized into something, you're associated with it. Uh, Paul talks about the, the Israelites were baptized into Moses. In other words, they're identified with Moses is what, what they're talking about. When we're baptized, when we are water baptized, what we're saying is ident I identify with Jesus Christ. When Jesus was baptized, was he baptized for the repentance of sin? No, because no, he had no sin. So what was, what was his baptism? He was baptized by John. John said, repent and be baptized. Remember, he even said to Jesus, I, I shouldn't baptize you because he knew that Jesus was sinless. But Jesus said no. And why did he say that? Because he knew he needed to do it so that he could identify with them. Identify with the nation of Israel. I, so, that, so, so, yeah, so that, that's a good way of understanding what baptism is. It's identifying with something. So you're always baptized into something. You're baptized with something. But that shows you're, you're being identified with that. So when you talk, when, I believe when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what you're simply saying is, I'm identifying with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is identifying with me. So when, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I believe, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 
that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I also believe there are special occasions where the Holy Spirit can come upon you in special ways. That would be his anointing. That would be his filling. In fact, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, the literal is keep on being filled. So filling of the Holy Spirit is not something that just happens once and that's it. Whereas baptism of the Spirit seems to be like that. The filling of the Holy Spirit seems to be more something where it's, it's a constant thing. And in fact, in the passage that Paul uses that term, he, talks of, he compares it to being drunk with wine. <laughs> so you're under the influence of wine. You're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is all about. So, any other questions on baptism of the Spirit? Okay. Um, works of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. He gives us gifts. So we've talked about that, and that's a whole other topic, which we don't have time, about the gifts like speaking in tongues, miracles. There are some Christians that believe that those were specific gifts given for specific reasons, and most of those reasons are no longer with us. So they would say some of those gifts are no longer necessary. Others believe that all the gifts are applicable today and need to be uh, worked and promoted. So those are some of the differences among Christians. So Holy Spirit gives us gifts. He fills us. He teaches us. He guides. He gives assurance. He prays. And symbols of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get through this. Sorry if we're a little late. Um, here are different symbols in the Bible that are used to refer to the Holy Spirit. Fire, wind, water, the dove, seal, earnest, and oil. And uh, some of these are, are pretty obvious and pretty familiar. Some may not be. Uh, the seal and the earnest. The seal was, was um, you know, when you, when you wrote a letter, you, you didn't have uh, envelopes that you licked and, and closed. You, you took a um, uh, wax, you melted it, and you closed it up. And that seal, if it was broken, that means somebody opened it up. So it says the Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal. And that's why I believe the Holy Spirit gives us that assurance. And it's a sign that the Holy Spirit will not leave us. And it's the same way with an earnest. When you get ready to buy your own home, or does, has anyone here ever bought their own home? Okay, have you bought a car? On time, on time, or did you pay out right? If you, pay, if you, if you took out a loan, uh, there was a, what's often called an earnest payment. That's an initial payment you give. When you buy a house, you're usually supposed to give an earnest payment or a down payment of what, 10%, 20%, whatever it is. So the Holy Spirit is like our down payment for eternity. So, all right, sorry, five minutes late. You can whip me or whatever you like to do. So, all right. Have a good weekend. Have a good Thanksgiving. I won't see you next week. Thank you, John.